good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you're listening from. Thank you for joining. My name is Peter Aima, a co-founder at Makrisa Foundation, and you're welcome to this exciting space. Before we drive into um, this discussion today, we would like to take a moment to tell you to look around your space to ensure there are no sharp objects, open electrical sources, or anything that can be harmful to you. Um, and we hope you have a great time in our discourse. Rabi, over to you. Rabi, I think you're muted. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this evening to discuss this important 16 days of action and the International Human Rights Day. I am especially very pleased to welcome Ghana and from my home country, Nigeria. I'm Rabi Adamumusa. I'm the founder and the CEO at Bakris. I would like to acknowledge Makrisa Foundation co-founder, Mr. Peter Aima, the team member have been working behind the scenes to make sure that everything is going well and to make this event a reality. The members of the Board of Trustees, the advisory board members, the foundation. So the past 16 days, we have been sensitizing young women and girls mm -hmm. about gender-based violence. We have gone around different communities and we have also gone around different high schools around Nigeria. We decided to conclude the 16 days of action with a live Facebook event to mark the international it's a foundation. We are committed to five basic things. We are committed to education. We are committed to leadership. We're also committed to healthcare and menstrual hygiene and also gender-based violence. In 2023, in 2022, sorry, and we have been working to make sure that we effect the change for this event. It's basically to to find long-term most most at risk in our society, like the indigenous women of Kaduna State and the young girls of vulnerable to violence because of their ethnicity, sexual orientation, and economic status that they do not need to rely on mainstream media to pass the message used as a great tool to interact and share, to avoid violence against women. By the year 2023 at Macrista Foundation, young girls in high school within Kaduna State, by creating the Macrista Girls and openly discuss relationships We, you know, discuss relationships, family matters, and just to make sure that the girls are okay. So, by, so kindly keep your cross crossed and make sure you are seated and if you're driving as it unfolds. And if you're at home, home make sure all your doors are locked and all offenses are off. off. As, as I said, should break in at order. So I'm going to read um, Rahila, is a development lawyer with expertise in women and children's rights and also an activist for human rights. Tizaria, and thereafter the Nigerian Law School, Abuja campus. She's 2017. She practices law in Abuja as a secretary. She's the pioneer chairperson of young women in politics Secretary of Human Rights Committee of the Nigerian Bar Association. She humanitarian and an administrator and has excelled in each of these areas. And made people. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Like I said, you're welcome.
Is Rahila here? Rahila? Okay, in the absence of Rahila, I'll just go ahead and um, the speakers, let me just start reading their bio. So, oh, Gloria Lemmy Johnson. Hello, good afternoon. Continue, we can hear you. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, good evening, where I'm from ever part of the country or the world you're listening. We are here today. This is the Margarita Foundation. We're completing the 16 days active activism of gender-based violence. And I would like to speak on what better ways can we get our boys to do better and respect women in particular. Well, basically, in a way to get our boys to respect the women and to do better is a very, very large topic, but I'll narrow it down. First of all, um, men who started as boys were made to believe they are supreme. They dominated over women. And so growing up, they believe they can do and undo. There's a adage that says, monkey see, monkey do. Most often, men who tend to become violent have seen violence growing up. And so they believe that's the best way to act towards women, to do things with women, and to behave towards women. Meaning what we have to do, we have to start with boys who grow up to become men. And if I may say, most often we grow the beast who turns out to violate the princess we have groomed. We need to make this men know they are gentlemen. To protect a woman, to look out for his sister, to look out for any female around him, you will groom a real gentleman who will respect a woman, who will see her as who she is. He will give her her place in society and in his life. Because I truly don't understand how you treat someone as a princess and later you want to start beating her up. So we as women also have so much to do to show the boys that they need to respect and treat women well. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to see us all here. Unity. Um, and once again, happy International Human Rights Day. So let me quickly, without further much ado, speak from Uganda. I think Gloria has been taken. Uganda and um, Ghana. So Karen Nyanguma Mokisa, one of our um, amazing discussants this afternoon. She's a writer, social an ardent human rights activist from Uganda. She is an international award winner of the Catherine Fleming 
founder and executive director of Women and Children's Rights Organization called Warm Hearts Foundation. Thank you very much, Joe. And then next on our um, uh, panelist, we have Vera Elikim Awi. She is a professional so- social and development worker and also a gender activist with more than 10 years working the team lead and senior program officer for gender and advocacy at International Needs Ghana. Thank you, Kim Awee, for joining us. Thank you, Gloria Lemmy Johnson, and thank you, Caroline Nyangoma Mokikisa. Thank you. So, start the discussion already, or what next? Are my panelists ready? Yes, Rahila, we are ready and we are excited right. to be here. So, I'm also excited. <laughs> I can't wait because I from um, this um, rich panelist that before us. So let me start with Caroline, who is also a, a human rights activist. Uh, in your experience, what do you think is the role of the society in curbing GBV? you know, and reducing the problem. I know our topic is tips for young girls in ending um, gender-based violence. So can you please just, you know, briefly cite please, in, um, you know, covid GBV. Thank you very much. Over to you, Caroline. Thank you, Rahila. Thank you, everyone. I'm very, very excited to be part of this space. I'm amazed about the lineup, our speakers, the organizers, Makrisa, Rabi, and Peter. This is beyond amazing. And we hope that by the time this space ends, then a lot of awareness creation would have been put in place. We are marking the end of the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. And uh, I trust and believe that the fight is not going to end today. The fight is going to go on. Every day is going to be a day to point out and fight gender-based violence. First and foremost, uh, the role of the society in curbing GBV, that is gender-based violence, that is a term we are going to be using. So commonly GBV, which simply means gender-based violence. So what is our role as a society? Who is the society? Society is me and you. Society is anyone who lives in a community. And we must realize that we, we have a responsibility of fighting gender-based violence. And one of the ways is whistleblowing. You know, we have always used the term call out when you see a gender-based violence case, when you see any abuse case, call out. But now it's no longer call out, now it's calling. Because we we have realized that calling out means uh, you're trying to just expose for the sake of it. But when you call in, you reach out for the responsible parties that can help the situation. For instance, the police, you know, instead of filming a scene where a man is abusing a woman or vice versa, instead of filming, filming is is as good as calling out. But when you call in, then you rescue the situation immediately. You call the responsible parties, you know. So we are saying as a society, can we train ourselves to always be calling in? Can we train ourselves to always not just a shame, but be uh, problem-solving agents. And secondly, we have to be changing agents or change agents. We as individuals, we are, unfortunately, we are in a community where we have, have a scarcity and the crisis of role models. Can they point out to Rabi as one of the women that have always fought against gender-based violence? When they go to the village, can they point out your name or your father's name or your friend's name? Are you a changing agent wherever you are? At your workspaces, you know, I remember that there was an HR at a certain workplace, an HR that is human resource manager at a certain workplace who happened who happened to be a she. And she used to harass every young girl who got pregnant, you know. So you can imagine this is the same woman who is fighting against the street production. So are we becoming change agents in whatever communities we are placed in, whatever spaces they are, families, workspaces, uh, our, our political spaces, and whatever you can call it. And thirdly, 
We need to break the gender barriers from the household level. You realize that most of these gender barriers are nurtured from our homesteads, are oh. nurtured from our households. When we are assigning roles, are we grooming boy, ch boy children to be bosses, to just sit and watch games, just sit and be on phone? And then we are we, we are telling girls to move around, washing and mopping everything. Are we engaging every sex in our homesteads? Because most of these of, of, of these barriers are groomed from our homesteads. We are training girls to be domats and we are training men or boys to be kings. And you know, there, there can't be peace when there is a king versus a domat, at least if there is a king versus a queen. So we need to balance up our roles as we are raising our children. And also we need to break these unfair social and cultural norms. For instance, FGM, that is fem, uh, um, a genital Gen female Gen mutilation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, talk about child uh, uh, marriages, you know, teenage pregnancies. We saw all these rates skyrocketing. You know, they got out of place during COVID because people were kept in homes with a perpetuators. We saw the safe people that we feel are safe, like maybe dads and moms. We saw them being the same yeah. perpetuators, the same children. We saw homes that are supposed to be safe havens become prisoners of themselves. So are we trying to break these gender barriers? You know, are we engaging responsible people like cultural leaders who are responsible and who are naturals and architects of these of, of these so-called narratives, you know? Mm -hmm. The religious leaders, you know, who are training women to be more domats than just women or maybe maybe counterparts. Are we putting value? on the home care systems, you know, as a woman remains home, are we valuing her efforts at her home? You know, all those are the questions, the rhetoric questions that we need to always ponder about, that we need to always think about in our areas, in our everyday lives. Yeah. This is not an issue of females. This is, this is an issue of everyone. It is a, it's a global issue. It's no longer now a women's issue. It's no longer a girl's issue. It is a global issue because what's the globe? It is when you and me, it is the government. It is everything that is oh. under the sun. Of and course, most importantly, you. we need to engage men in discussions. Let's not look at them as the enemies. Let's not just look at them as, as perpetuators. We must remember that there are good men out there. There are good feminists out there. There are good men who are raising us. A, a man who raised Dura Hill, a man who raised Gloria, a man who raised Vera. Those are still good men. So are we engaging them in these discussions? You know, you cannot blame a man for doing something wrong, yet you did not actually teach them what to do. Some of them yeah. grew up in these spaces of ignorance. We need to remind them. We need to use these spaces. We need to tell them constantly. We need to engage them in capacity building sessions. And hey, you, we need to engage even the people that are handling these cases like the police. You know, of course. some of these of course. people do not even know that there is anything like online gender-based violence. Are we engaging them? Are we telling them what to do? And it's our responsibility. And hey, community, when we are doing this work, I must remind you that you do not pay us. So you don't hold us responsible. You know, don't just criticize us. Support us. Let us work yeah. alongside each other. And also, lastly, but not the least, let us partner with agencies, with everyone, like the government. I'm amazed that Makrisa in Nigeria is working of alongside Warm Hearts in Uganda. What does that mean? That we are going to put ideas together and we see how we can kill this common enemy that is gbv generous violence i right. can of course it. okay no, no no i don't know all right gonna, you know on that let me just go over to vera i don't know all right thank okay you. you yeah amazing yes thank you so much carol and and something really key uh, stick to me uh when, and it's actually linked to the next question I was going to ask Vera. You know, even here in Nigeria, you know, security agencies blaming victims, blaming suspects, and being blamed. So going back to the perpetrators, what can you say about that? Because we still have people that stay in being abused, you know. 
Uh, Ms. Vera, over to you, please. Thank you, Rahila. I hope you can hear me. Um, yes, yes, loud and clear, please. Yes, we can hear you. And then the network is not breaking. Okay, Sorry. so first of all, I believe it. Okay, so first of all, I believe we are We don't seem, we can't seem to get you. Hello, Vera. Hello. Yes, I think we can hear, we can just okay. go ahead with um, Gloria. Can you hear me now? Yeah, okay, go ahead. Okay, so yeah, I was yes, saying Vera, that, that I, I was saying that nobody wants to be a victim. I mean, we, we Instead, we are in a society that exposes us to violence and abuse. And um, it is our perception that, you know, people play victim when they are in situations that actually expose them to abuse. And I was mm. also sharing an interesting experience. Um, when I was about 10 years, I was probably the only girl amongst about five uh, boys. And in that experience, I was riding a bike bicycle with the boys because I wanted to have fun, you know, children, and I got hurt. And once I got home, the first thing I got was a good beating by my auntie who asked me why I got hurt. And that experience has stayed in my head for so long because I felt that I was hurt and I was a victim, yet I got beaten for being hurt as a child. And this was not even my mother or my, you know, this was my auntie who didn't understand why I got hurt. When my mother came, she also didn't understand why I got hurt. And some of these things just makes you question yourself. The people closer to us are possibly or are the people who first victimize us when we find ourselves in abusive situation, uh, in instances. And then our friends, and then we're also talking about social media. And then to the security agencies that are rather supposed to protect us. You see that these people are actually contributing to the abuse because for us human beings, most of them, it feels good to just blame other people. And um, you hear questions like Rahila Rice said, why did you let it happen? Why were you wearing what you were wearing? Well, what were you doing there at that time? Uh, you know, um, as a woman, your mouth, you know, you are talking too much. You are too empowered. You are too confident, you know. And even when you go to the institution, sometimes even if it's a health institution or a police station, they would even shout at you for even coming to report a case. So a lot of people do shy away from these things. But coming back to the main is, um, issue of the institutions, these are institutions that are supposed to protect us and not to you know, contribute to the violence. But this is what we are seeing. And this is happening also because of the issue of apathy. You know, Some people who haven't gone through some of these violence or abuse or are not associated to the issue do not feel linked. And so there's some level of disinterest you know, in the issues. And so they also just contribute to the abuse because they can't feel your pain. They can't feel that link to you. They are not your relatives. And so they really don't see uh, what the point is. I think there's also an issue of institutional fatigue. You know, some of the institutions are overburdened. And to add to it, they do not have enough resources to respond to the, the issues. And so in displacing, you know, they end up contributing to... Um, some of these issues and then make the victim feel like they caused this abuse or brought these violence onto themselves. And so then there's the issue of also the personal idiosyncrasies where people from their culture, their personal beliefs and all that are able to displace, you know, and, and victimize the victim the more, making you feel like you are the reason why all this is happening to you. Um, I'm very certain that we all want prevention Nobody wants to be a victim, and then later we are looking for all the institutions that can prepare, mm. you know, respond to it. We all just want to stay in a safe environment. We all want peace of mind. You know, we all we don't want places where you know women are abducted. You know, where there's rape, where there's child marriage, where people are killing people because of relationship issues, and mostly because mm. of patriarchy. You know, we would prefer an environment that is really safe where we have peace of mind where everybody's just going about their, their, you know, their, their lives. 
And, um, exactly. You know, so I, I, I strongly believe that when it comes to victimizing the abuse, it starts from home, sometimes from our culture. The woman is to be blamed. Mm-hmm. The victim is to be blamed. And the institutions are also not helping because sometimes they also do not have the right training to deal with some of these issues. Um, again, coming to the institutions, within the police service, for instance, in Ghana, we have the Domestic Violence and Victim Support Unit. It is within the police service, but this is a specialized unit that is supposed to deal with issues of SGBV. So they are giving specialized training, you know, to deal with some of these issues. So if we have institutions that are not trained within this area, weak, you know, and so they continue to make the victim feel like it is their fault um, because of where they were, what they were wearing, what they said, or, oh, you know, how they were mm-hmm. So, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Zara. That was very enlightening. But then I know that you feel, okay, don't you don't have to blame yourself for any done to you. You know, and just like you said, our goal should be prevention, that level of prosecuting and all those things. It is very, very important. GBV is it's, it, we've gotten to the barest minimum in our era. So in line with that, I will go over to Madam Gloria uh, uh, dealing with the issue of survivors, victims, or whatever. A victim says, how can we as a society do better in encouraging? We don't want uh, victims on the street, but can we, you know, how, how can survivors be able to come up and break the silence? How can they be able to, you know, uh, 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 a predicament and come out and say, yes, I, I want justice. I don't want to be blamed. How can we achieve that? Especially to try to get tips that will help them. What advice will you Miss Gloria. Um, and thank you for this platform, Macarisa. We're talking about gender. Thank you, Madam Rabi, for this opportunity. Tim survivors to come up and speak. Like Madam Vera said, she gave an now, most often, it's the same family you're from that actually to blame you for some of these things. They begin to tell, ask you, where were you? Why were you there? In dealing with people, we have to let them know they are safe. If would I be, if I come to complain about an issue, Family will blame me for dragging the family name. Society because they will blame me. You are safe. And this is not because you were at the wrong place. And you're driving a car, you have an act. You for that? No to them why do we do that as a society and how safe is if they come and complain to you am I sure my secrets are safe or before all about town we need to let them know they are safe safe after complaining to us let's create safe havens and be safe after complaining about some of these issues Issues so that when they, where we can keep them, where we can nurture them out of what they have gone through. Let's also try it and in pass. Is why is this survivors don't come out? Is because they are afraid of empowerment in a particular way. But if we empower some of the to come on because I know I don't have to fall back to anyone for support because 
they can come out and do some of these things and they will be free to come out and know their life is not in danger. Save. Then they will be protected. Let them be sure their secrets are also safe with us. It was an event that happened. This person is not who he is. Let's stop labeling people with the events that happened to them. Come out and speak and save some other people from encountering some of so, Thank you very much, Ravi and Rahila. Back to That was a good one. Though you were breaking at some point, I think the network was um, back here. All right. So are we still? We go for a, a cup of water. <laughs> it has been a, an intro. Uh, so, uh, Ms. Hello. Hello. Raila, we can hear you. Oh, oh. Yeah. Yes, Raila, we can hear yeah, you. We can hear you. Okay, so let me just come. How can we ensure better and safe environment, safe society for women and with um, your words of encouragement to young girls who also look up to you as um, audience this evening? We're trying to get young girls to, you know, at um uh, better to be better adults as they are growing up, you know, with mistakes that some of us did, you know, and as and, and GBV is reduced to the barest minimum in our society. So environment for young girls. And also what is your advice to young girls listening? Uh, hello, Rahila. Is that? Hello. Yes, there are glitches. Yes, is that question? To... Because there was a glitch somewhere. I didn't hear that. Is that question to me? Oh. Hello, Rahila. Hello. Hello. Yes, Rahila, we can hear you. Hello, Caroline. If you're not there, let me just switch over to Kim. Yeah, I'm here, Rahila Morong. Oh, okay. Did you get the question I asked? I have the question, my dear. I'm good. Yes, just, just briefly. Our time is almost, um, you know, past spent. Yes, okay. Yes. Uh, how can we ensure a better and safe environment for women and girls? Yes. And uh, I'll go first by, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just... Um, dissect this from the grassroots root to the, to, to, from the lower to the upper level. And starting from the upper level, what am I saying by upper level? The government agencies, the global communities, first and foremost, we need to increase funding to end violence. You now you realize that there are so many acting agents, there are very many activists around. And when you really check whatever they are doing, most of it is genuine work, you know, there are very many initiatives. I've been seeing Macrissa doing a lot of work in schools, in different learning institutions. But when you check her account, you might find she is draining her account to do this, just like we are doing at Warm Hearts. So can we be funded? Can and, and this funding should also not just be looked at from the global perspective. As in, as an individual, when you see some organizations doing some of this work, can you dig from your pocket? Because whatever it is. Everything starts with a cost. Everything has a cost implication. Even when you transport yourself to a school, that's, that's a cost. When you hire a microphone, that's 
of course, as we talk now, we are using our data, you know, we, we, we are using finances to just do this. So if there is any opportunity, let uh, uh, funding agents be proactive, let them be like willing to support us uh, from individual, wherever you are placed. Be willing, truly really giving because these girls cannot, you know, okay. finances. And also, we have to take it up as an individual space. Let it be an individual responsibility. Take it, like, let it be, like, part of your daily routine. Like, you wake up, you brush your teeth, you know, you shower and dress up. You know, so let it be part of your routine that wherever you see anything to do with GBV, um, wherever you find a girl getting tortured, whatever, like even make it a daily routine to even post something about it, maybe a monthly thing, maybe a yeah. day, like weekly thing, post a message, say something, say no, say a big yes, so he likes, so that it shouldn't just be the work they are doing for the sake of pleasing Rabbi or school. Of course. Keep girls in school. When a girl is educated, she has a voice. I think we all are speaking because we have been educated, right? You know, uh, uh, so some of us have masters, some of us have gone to school. We can communicate in English, which is a global language, because we are educated. But when you don't give a voice to this girl, when you don't enable her to get educated, it simply means, first and foremost, an educated mm. girl has a low self esteem. Well, she can't express herself in a language we all can understand. You mm. know, so let us try and beat those who cannot. Can we support them? Not just educate them, but give them education that empowers them. There is a difference. between uh, educating. Not just pass marks, you know, and maybe get good marks and, you know, you graduate, but give education that also enables someone to amplify their voices. And also, let us champion women's economic empowerment. You know, when you educate a woman, automatically, in a way, you have educated a whole globe. When you empower them financially, you are empowering the whole community. Yeah. A woman's money, when you be so critical, I applaud men who educate their girls and boys. I applaud them. Thank you so much. But I must remind everyone, but when a woman has an economic empowerment, she ably and smoothly educates the children. They have even given up on begging for school fees from the father's children. And now what they are doing is taking up yeah. the rules to educate these girls because they know what education really means. And most importantly, include girls and women in decision-making processes. Recently, I saw a post on Facebook where there was a youth conversion. I think it was in South Africa. And, and looking at the audience, the youths were 50s, 60s, 70s. I'm like, okay, where are the youths? I, I tried to people and they were like five youths, you know? So they say youths, but then the people who attend the youth conversions are actually old people. You know, they are stepping us on it. Even when it's our time to represent our voices, they still take up like five people mm. for just for the sake of showing that we're saying let's uh, uplift girls. Are we getting them their voice also be heard? Let's not just speak for them. Let us also give them a chance to speak. Thank you. Make a decision. Speak, of course. <laughs> yes, because they know what they want most, more than any. Anyone of us, you know, yes, and Thank lastly, you so much. engage these we, we, we Yes, Rahila. Um, thank you so much. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm done. 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 That was the last that point. Was, oh, I'm sorry. So, this this topic is. Uh, no, 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 no problem at all. No problem. For this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Miss Carol. All right. So, quickly, uh, Miss Vera. Okay, so can I just um, say lastly the advice? All right. Bye. 
just under a minute. Hello? Rahila, we can hear you. Yes, Hello. we can hear you, Rahila. Go ahead. Hello, we can, oh, I can, can hear you. I can hear you. Can hear you okay, can let hear me you. just ask very uh, and is almost up. How can we get our okay, justice thanks. system to be more survival so that we, we have cases in court? Yes. Sorry, let me just explain. We have cases in court. Sometimes survivors give up and lose interest. So sometimes they don't come out to say justice. So how can we strengthen our justice system? Uh Raila, thank you so much. That's a really big question because the justice system in itself, it's really big. Um, I just want to start quickly oh. from the fact that really, in actual truth, justice starts from home. You know, when uh, families and, you know, families do not hide the issues and, and try to make, um, you know, make it seem like it's not an issue and we can deal with it at the house level and then, you know, then there's no justice served because mostly reporting starts from this place. So moving to the justice system, uh, I believe that we need a lot of coordination between the justice system, the policing system, the health system, and then the social servicing, you know, so that most of these cases that are reported are not lost, you know, because sometimes by the time it gets to the justice system, there's not much evidence, you can't find the victim, families are, you know, interfering and all that. So I believe that if we have strong coordination between the policing health, the social welfare, and then the justice system, we should be able to track cases and also ensure that when cases start, they do end and the victims are given justice and they are also given some kind of compensation because reporting is expensive and, and it's not easy. Um, capacity building is also very important that the agencies that deal with some of these protection issues are given training and capacity building to be able to handle victims and survivors of SGBV, whether it's males or it's females, because really this fight is not just about women. It's a, it's a partnership between men and women to ensure that our environment is safe. So capacity building to be able to respond quickly to these issues don't lose evidence and then be able to encourage these survivors to go through as well. And then also just to look at it from a gender transformative approach, you know, where we give attention to, especially the girl. So we talk about a child, a child is not a girl. If we talk about a young person, a young person is not a girl. If we talk about a woman, a woman is a girl. If an issue affects a girl, let's look at it as an issue affecting a girl and not just a child. To be able to tailor the responses to that child and that to that girl and that girl is not just a girl it's probably a pregnant girl or a girl surviving abuse or a girl who has been in a child marriage situation or a girl who has been defiled these are very very different situations and should be handled as such again we need to tighten um, our laws you know some countries have laws that allow certain things like child marriage which is an injustice you know so we need to tighten those laws and ensure that the justice system is effectively working by also monitoring you know some of the activities checking our boxes to see whether are we really delivering justice or there's some nepotism and some bribery and corruption yeah. in our societies yeah. which we need to get rid of so just some tips to the girls um i just want to tell my fellow sisters that don't be afraid to speak up speak mm. your truth speak your truth I also want to let them know that they need to spend time with themselves, learn to love themselves and get to know themselves. Because by loving yourself and by knowing yourself, it gives you a certain confidence, you know, that nobody just takes you for granted and treats you the way you do not deserve. I also want my fellow sisters to know that you are complete. Whether you have big hips and small breasts or you have big breasts and small hips, you are a very complete human being very complete there's absolutely nothing wrong with you and nobody should make you feel like the victim and last but not least report injustice anywhere it happens always apply emotional intelligence and always be risk alert you know if you find yourself in an environment where you are not comfortable 
leave or immediately report. Um, just to also let them know that we are supporting them, we are cheering them on, and, and we are here for them. And they should just keep doing what they are doing to be able to be empowered. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zaya. Question. Yeah, so quickly, Ms. Um, Gloria, I think you'll be rounding up for us. Question for you and also your advice for young girls. But uh, before that, I'll let what is it that we can do better as advocates for, uh, you know, um, a, 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 you know, where a lot of things are not going on right, of course, one or two things need to be put in place. Strategies can we employ in less than maybe three minutes? <laughs> 10 minutes is the whole time <laughs> well first of all what we'll need to employ is we'll need to start throwing this um, gender-based violence in the faces of people let them know this is wrong we should not shy away from it it is an issue that needs to be tackled when we see issues like this where we see these issues we shouldn't hide them we should bring them out if we know some victims that have encountered some of these things we as advocates should build a protection around them and then bring them up so people know these things are happening. They are happening to people right in our very own eyes. They are our neighbors, they are our sisters, they are friends, they are our colleagues in the office. We should not shy away from them. And if they do tell us, we should not take it round town. We should try and keep their secrets secrets. At advocacy agencies, we should also know how to handle critical situations, especially where life of a person is in danger. Let's build some form of protection around them. You could take them into your homes or you take them to where you know they will be safe. Their life will be safe. They will be protected. They will be catered for and provided for. Where their lives would not be endangered. And if they do have a family, let's try and reach out to the family to let the family know it was an event and not a person. And nobody would gladly walk into situations like that. They would not walk into it. My advice to young girls is don't keep quiet. When you see some of the stresses around you, don't pretend they are not happening and don't try to protect the perpetrators. Bring them to book. Find someone you can confide in and talk to them about it. A true friend, a true sister. And if no one in your family believes in you, there is someone who would believe and trust you. You can talk with them. And I assure you, they would be out there to listen and to protect and help you out in all of this. Don't be afraid, women. Let us speak out. Silence is not the answer. Silence will kill us. But of let's course. shout it out loud so everyone will hear. Thank you so much. Back to you, Rahim. Thank you so much, Ms. Gloria. I love the way you ended it. Silence is a key. It's loud. In fact, if there's a note, if there's a time for us to speak, it is now. You go out and show, speak, let your voice be heard. Very much, Vera. Thank you very much, Gloria. It has been a rich and you uh, can go on actually, Marquisa. But um, I've been given a note that the time is up. Ms. Rabi? Over to you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today for this live event. It's the first Macrisa Foundation, and we're very excited. Thank you so much. Thank you all. I understand some of our advisory member, board members are present. Live one from the United States, another one from Canada. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rahila. It was great. Thank you, Carol. She spoke with the past. She said, you know, this is like my, um, the, the, the topic is very dear to her heart. And thank you, um, Vera from Ghana. Thank you, Oye. Make sure you we add this event. Thank you so much. And for all our um, again, and um, please don't forget to share, and like our page on Facebook. YouTube. Also, if you need to speak with us directly, go to info at Macrisa. Visit our website at www.macrisafoundation.org.
from Kaduna, Nigeria. Bye. Bye. Thank you. See you next time. Bye bye, everyone. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> bye. 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 Bye.